have. Let's have a look. Good evening, everybody. Happy Saturday. I have to share with you, I am here by the skin of my teeth. Um, some of you may notice that I have a banner behind me that I haven't had all week. That's because I'm not at home. And I thought it was only fair to, um, to cover up somebody else's um, closet, actually, which is where I'm sitting at the moment. Um, we've had a rather interesting day. This uh, rather inconvenient storm has turned up and I have no power or Wi-Fi at home. So um, it's been a little bit interesting. And <laughs> Like I say, I'm not at home. I've come out of my uh, come out of my home and, and borrowing somebody else's Wi-Fi and power to be with you this evening. And um, yeah, it's been a little interesting. Half of my stable yard is at the other end of the field. Uh, my horse is rather distressed. My dogs can't believe what on earth is going on. I think we all feel like we're in a tumble dryer. So I hope you guys are all OK and uh, haven't suffered too badly with any storm damage. And um, yeah, and I hope that you're all with us tonight because we have the very lovely Zoe with us, who is in the group today to talk to us about grooming. So, you know, you might think, what's grooming got to do with breeders? You know, why do we need to worry about that? We might have a short coated breed. We might not be, might not be a thing that we need to worry about too much. And um, as, 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 as breeders probably do we need to be worrying about too much about grooming advice and actually yes you do of course because you're often as breeders the first port of call an owner will say this is a dog that has a coat and this coat is going to take a, a you know maintenance to keep the dog healthy and comfortable and we need to be giving owners um the most current advice around grooming especially with the increase in popularity around poodle crosses and the management of, of their particular coat types and um there is no one better to give advice on that subject than the very lovely zoe who is with us this evening so welcome to our group zoe thank you for having me i'm excited to be here you know how much i like talking about this stuff <laughs> absolutely it is your thing you it's are very my thing it. it yeah. is my thing it's my thing that i do every day Excellent. And you've been doing it all day today, haven't you? Bless you. I have. Yeah, I just said to you, I've got hair in my eyeballs, still haven't had time for, this, for a shower yet. Hair in my eyeballs and under my fingernails. But we'll the joys, the joys. The joys of dog grooming. Yeah. So I wanted to, I wanted to kick off um, with the, from a, from a groomer's point of view, what's your perfect way of starting a puppy? So let's just say somebody rings you up and they say, hey, I've got a 10, 12 week old puppy uh -huh. and it's going to have, it's going to need coat care. Let's not get into specific breeds, but let's just say this puppy's going to need coat care. Um, what, what, what does that look like? What's the, what's the best what's thing? What's my absolute best, best yeah. case scenario? Um, before we even go into best case scenario, I'm going to backtrack a step and say that for me, grooming is not a haircut. So whether you've got a Staffy or a Jack Russell or whether you've got a Poodle or a Doodle, um, grooming for me is teeth, it's nails, it's ears, it's the body check, it's the lumps and the bumps as the dog gets older, it's all those things that can be missed by owners. Um, so even the even the even those of you that are grooming, um, that are breeding that don't have a long coated dog, it's still something to be aware of to send your owners somewhere where all that other stuff gets checked because the amount of things, even nail problems, ear problems, that kind of stuff that I see that can be prevented. Um, so just going to throw that in there right from the beginning. Yeah, top tip me, number one. Love yeah, it. Yeah, for it's me. Like a free bit check. Yeah, all dogs. Grooming is all dogs, whether they've got long hair or, or not. So because it covers so much Excellent. more than a haircut. Um, so me, for me, the ideal is when I get an owner ring and say, I'm going to get a puppy. <laughs> so even before they brought the puppy home, my perfect, um, my perfect owner that comes to me is one that's actually thought about that earlier on like even even pre-puppy um and if it's if it's some if they've already got the puppy at home as early as possible i want that puppy in here it needs needs a little bit of time to settle down at home you know you don't want to yeah. be taking your dog to the groomer the first day it's brought home um but as as soon as possible as soon as your puppy settled in a little bit at home i want to be part of that brand new experience i want to be one of the first things that a person's puppy um see the experiences when they're home i want that to be a really good experience and to build that relationship uh, so one of the biggest um one of the biggest struggles i see in the salon is actually separation anxiety before we even go into grooming okay. is that, that puppy's going to be left with a stranger so if you can 
make your groomer, your, your owners can make your groomer part of that team of people um, that your puppy knows from a really young age half problems in a grooming salon are solved at that point. So that's where I like to start is literally as early as possible. Fantastic. Yeah. Really good advice. So how do you um, mitigate against the dog being anxious? So if, we, if we're going to be dealing with um, separation anxiety, you know, at, at, at the groomers and also at the vets, if they're going in and they're having to have treatment, it's the same principle, isn't it? Leaving yeah. the dog with strangers. Mm -hmm. what, can, what can our breeders be advising their owners to do to mitigate that? Yeah, slow down, slow down. Everything is too fast. I feel, I feel that what we ask of our very young dogs very early on in their lives is often too much too soon. We don't take into consideration there's massive life changes between leaving a breeder, arriving in a home, all the new stuff that they're learning and experiencing. And then often what happens is that, um, I know you've got a little cockapoo puppy, could be anything, got a little cockapoo puppy, the owner thinks by sort of six months old or whatever, oh, you know, going to take it for a groom. Um, those early grooming experiences, which are often too late, they often clash with the early vet experiences, which have often been, you know, can also be a fairly traumatic first experience yeah. Yeah. as well. And um, what can often happen, and I think we miss the scent picture a lot. So a grooming salon is, in a dog's mind, actually rather like a vet. So those two things often, ha often happen very closely together. Puppies have been left in a stressful environment, two different stressful environments, mm. which smell of disinfectant. Very similar. The dogs, yeah. potentially, yeah. I don't run my salon like this, but potentially they're noisy environments and the dogs barking. They can smell the fear from other dogs. Like that whole world of scent that we don't, yeah. we don't take in. Um, I think what happens a lot of the time with our young dogs, they get thrown into the vets, thrown into the groomers, and we just hope that everything is going to be okay. <laughs> and, it often, and it often isn't. So slow let down. Me just, let me just interject there. Um, so for those guys who have done any of my courses, you'll know how important, and this is actually something that I've not touched on this, this week, and I'm really, really pleased that Zoe's given me the opportunity to speak into this this evening, because um, the, the early scent introduction that we talk about in the puppy socialization courses is, is, is something that a lot of people might not be um, necessarily familiar with, but scent is something that I am massively passionate about. I am a scent work instructor and, you know, it's fairly obvious that dogs um, see the world through their noses, not through their eyes. Mm -hmm. And the early scent introduction is something we do with puppies from day two or three, right up until day 16. And it's exposing the puppy to a different scent on a daily basis. And the reason for this is that just like a puppy needs to have different textures and levels, just like a puppy needs to be able to cope with different visual stimulus and different sound stimulus, for a dog, its scent is hugely important because they do very much view the world through their noses. So puppies who have had um, ESI done to them at the same time as ENS in those very very early stages cope with a world of olfaction yeah because that's what it is for them yes. so when they are confronted by the different scents so just imagine tiny puppy if you just close your eyes and just imagine that you're a tiny puppy and you are being taken into a new home and all of the different scent that comes from that. So you've gone in a different car with different people. You've gone into a different home with possibly different pets, different children. Each person has their own scent. All of that is a, is a whole new scent picture. Then they have to start going into the garden with all the different scents of that particular garden versus the garden they've been in. Then they have to go to the vets and all of the different scent that's in there. Just imagine that the disinfectants, the vets, the vet nurses, the chemicals, the products, the other animals that have been in there, the, the smell of the car park, the smell of the car, the whole thing. And then the same again when they go into the groomers or when they go to the school playground or when they go to the park or when they go for a walk in town in the market as they're walking along the street. 
they smell the world around them. So mm-hmm. setting your puppies up properly using um, ESI as babies really helps with exactly what Zoe's talking about. Um, mm-hmm. So that links in really, really nicely with something that we talk about in that mm-hmm. in that course. So um, and it's and it's great that you know as breeders we've got a tool that we can use that is going to help puppies in the situation that Zoe's talking about exactly that so that's perfect so so what can you do to you know to to sort of mitigate that so what are you suggesting Zoe that they come in and they're with you for a little while or longer than that or yeah so just just off the back of what you were saying there, the easiest puppies to acclimatize to grooming are confident puppies, which is why I'm so passionate about talking to, to you guys as breeders. Um, because I have a lot of puppies come through my hands that haven't seen the world. So when they come in here and they're suddenly exposed to everything in here, noisy machine. If you've ever, I only did this really recently. I held a pair of clippers, just my dog grooming clippers on my head behind my ear because they don't feel that loud in your hands. I've got quite a quiet pair and I held them up behind my ear and I was like, oh my goodness. Like that, that, there's, there's so much in here that we just take for granted that our dogs are like, oh, what is that? I've never seen that before. So confident puppies, puppies like you just said that have smelt different things, have had different textures under their feet. The equipment in here moves, it rattles, tables go up and down surfaces are different um I'm physically handling your dog I've got to be able to hold them touch them you know poke them and prod them and and the more that you've your dog and your puppies have been exposed to early on in those little steps that so that they're confident they're the puppies that come into me and go oh huh, eh, it's just something else that's new as opposed to oh my goodness what is that terrifying monster and who's that terrifying person person so that early confidence stuff yeah really really does make a massive massive difference and I've forgotten what the other bit your question well no no that I mean that's that's the answer to it isn't it the answer to it is is you know you're gonna you're gonna you're going to have puppies coming in and if they're if they're more confident and they're more more socialized full stop they're going to cope with yeah. the environment i mean yeah. we on on the on the point that you make about the um the vibration and the noise from yeah. the clippers we actually we actually use electric toothbrushes a good start point yeah that was on my list tonight yeah and we put um electric toothbrushes and we start on their paw when mm-hmm. they're probably about 3 weeks old just and a few tiny. seconds Mm -hmm. just so that they can feel a little bit of vibration and just so that they can you know they're not sometimes their ears are not even properly open at the point that we're doing this but it's more about the feel of it in the first instance yeah we just do it every day just just and then we start Mm -hmm. to take the electric toothbrush up their arm and if they seem to be concerned about it we don't put it on them Mm -hmm. we just put it near them and then build up to putting it on them just so that they can get a little bit more, you know, used to dealing with the vibration and dealing with the, because I do breed a coated breed, I breed doodles. So, you know, at the end of the day, they're going to have to deal with it. They're going to need a haircut. Yeah, yeah, they will. They're going to need a haircut. They're going to need a haircut. <laughs> oh, good. Well, I'm glad to, you know, that's, it's positive that that's of, that is of benefit. So um, I feel like not all, um, so not all breeders are going to have grooming equipment at home. Like some are, like if, you, if you're a doodle breeder and you've got, you know, you've got a, I don't know, half a dozen doodles at home or however many, the likelihood is you're going to have clippers, you're going to do some of that grooming yourself, you're going to have some drying, you know, equipment. Um, but I, I also know that there's a lot of breeders that do a beautiful job. They might just have, you know, one or two bitches. They might just send them to a grooming salon. They're not necessarily going to have that equipment at home. Yeah, yeah. They're being able to find other things around you and in your home and in your environment to introduce. That's really important. If you do have access to grooming equipment or can get hold of stuff secondhand, for, the, for that really early training period, like I would recommend you did that. But even just your hair dryer, like you said, your electric toothbrush, your husband's yeah. clippers, yeah. Like there's things yeah. at home that you can still be using without going Absolutely. out. Absolutely. Four hundred pounds more, you know, on an expensive dryer. Yes, but yeah, yeah, yeah. We really, well, I think one of the best bits of kit I ever invested in was a was a second hand grooming table. Yes. Yeah. No, you know, not expensive. I think I paid like, I don't know, 30 quid for it on Marketplace. They, not, they didn't have the whole frame and the whole thing, but just the table. Um, and yeah. because it's got the little dots on the top of it, so it feels a little feels bit different. different. It's got a blue top. It just feels uh-huh. different under their under their paws. Yeah. And we just pop the puppies on it. And by the time they're going home, you know, they're they're mm-hmm. okay to stand on it. They don't feel too vulnerable being on it. 
Yeah. And by um, the time they come into me, they're like, oh, it's the grooming table. I know what this feels like. Yeah, completely. Yeah. completely. Exactly. And, well, I mean, we use it. We, we have the vet come to us to do vaccinations and stuff like that because I don't want one of my puppies very, very early experiences to be going to the vets and being stabbed in the back of the neck and all of that. I, yeah. I tend to, you know, I, I feel that if he comes to me when they're eight weeks old for their first vaccines, they get the opportunity to have the first early, you know, those first mm-hmm. proper experiences of being out and about away from away mm-hmm. from our uh, our environment of being with the family and, and 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 then by the time they're coming up for their second vaccination point they've been in the sling everywhere and they've been all over the place yeah, so and hopefully they've been in to meet their vet and have a treat and left again at that yes, point exactly which is also that. what I do in here and the groomer yeah, yeah and the groomer sure. and that's exactly what I was going to say so, on. <laughs> but we we have them on that table so when he comes they're already used to being on that table mm-hmm. And, and sometimes, actually, Lacey made the point a little while ago, she actually deliberately put it wonkily so that it rocked a little bit when they got on it. And they were all like, my lot were used to going on wobble balls. They were like, yeah, this is cool. Um, but yeah, but you can imagine that some would be uh, some would be worried about that. But no, that's a really good tip. So yeah, grabbing some secondhand mm-hmm. equipment. Yeah, yeah. And sure. it could be a bit of payback as well, couldn't it, to be using your husband's hair clippers on the dog? I quite like that. Maybe use them on the dog <laughs> oh I think so I think so <laughs> I won't be responsible for that piece of advice. <laughs> that's on your head <laughs> oh that's funny <laughs> right what's um, the next question so I like my owners to stay as well so going to sort of that mm. early just talking about again those early experiences so just an example of I, I've had a little dog in today she's a she's a Springer Poodle Cross and she's now coming up a year old and she's got the most lovely dedicated owners and they've been coming into me she came in at 12 weeks old so pretty much when they first had her she just about landed um and they were thoughtful owners they brought her in and I said to them look there's two ways of doing this you can leave her with me I can do it the traditional route I can get your dog room or we can do it like this which is my preference and we can take our time and you can stay with her and we'll get her used to things gently and that's what they wanted because I'm still experimenting with different things in here all the time. She's been into my salon every between every two and four weeks since she was 12 weeks old. So a lot of commitment on behalf of those on behalf of those owners. And she now comes tearing into the salon. She jumps on the table. She's like, where's my cheese? Where's my cheese? She's not scared of anything in here. She's still never had a bath in the salon. She's been bathed at home because it's still too much. She's quite a sensitive little dog. Um, we're still, we're only just introducing dryers and things now. So actually we rush our puppies if you can set your owner's expectations that they get to find a groomer who they can work with and take take it at your dog's pace um I don't know I sort of how many of your you know the dog, people watching this stuff will actually know what like a full groom constitutes so what's fairly normal in a salon for a puppy groom the first time some groomers will have them in for a you know a meet and a treat and send them out like that's brilliant it doesn't always happen um the first groom then is usually a bath it's usually a bath eye trim bum trim and dryer so that that first or second time in the salon it's already too much we've already had a full bath and a full dry yeah and it's just too fast if if you can take one piece of advice away from like this whole conversation it's slow down slow down baby dogs short sessions this little dog has never been in the salon for more than 40 minutes no because we wouldn't do it with our children we wouldn't do it with our children do we we take our children to the barber shop and they will sit in the chair and they will have their fringe cut and then they'll get a lolly they'll get the lolly and then they'll go home (laughs) that's all just trim your fringe and then you're going to go home but our dogs are expected to go for ears nails two hours stood on the table still you expect a baby dog to stand two hours still on a table they might already have tangles in their coat because they haven't come in early enough and their owners don't haven't brushed them properly. Yep. I'm handling every single part of their body. You know, they're tired. And they don't know you. They don't know me. The whole thing. And, you know, it's uncomfortable and it tugs and the machines are scary. And it's just too much. And honestly, if I was a young dog, I'd be going, get off me. Seriously, just leave me alone. Leave me alone. You know? yeah. Well, just and actually, fun. for some dogs... Um, 
and I don't want to get too technical around the the whole training piece yeah. but but for, for for some dogs that are one event learning that type dogs yeah. that whole you know in, in the wrong kind of groomer I'm not suggesting you but the wrong kind yeah. of groomer who a groomer that's tired a groomer mm -hmm. that's been working with dogs that are not well handled all day mm -hmm. who yeah. grabs the dog's leg mm -hmm. to brush it pulls on a knot it hurts the puppy yeah. the puppy reacts like a puppy reacts mm -hmm. and that isn't by writing a strongly worded letter to the financial times it's yeah. by snapping and snarling and doing yeah you know that's not a position we want to be putting our dogs and puppies in yeah. because then that one event learning then happens at home yeah. when the the owner's child sits next to the dog and knocks the dog's paw and in the dog's mind it's a it's a repeat yeah, of that can behavior be yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I, I make mistakes in here as well. You know, I've had, you know, I've had a puppy in recently and a lot of it again is about expectations. And I think as breeders, you're in such a beautiful, beautiful position to help your owners manage their expectations around the grooming process. I had a young poodle in recently who had actually, she'd actually been bred by a groomer. I don't know the groomer. I don't know where the puppy came from. Um, most groomers that breed poodles or most poodle um, breeders in the first place they'll, they'll do feet and faces and, yeah. and lots of yeah, things yeah, 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 this puppy yeah. hasn't had very much handling and the owner expectation was also very high in what they wanted me to do with their puppy so I'm then in a position of managing an owner expectation and a young dog that's not used to handling and like you said that one time learning experience then it really doesn't take very much to send that dog away going, that's it, I'm done, I'm done with don't grooming. And I know there's 15 it. years left don't of do it. Yeah, yeah. five weeks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah. I find particularly, you know, I am a poodle crossbreeder, so I have poodles at home mm -hmm. and, you know, and I've been doing it for 16 years. And what, what I what I see is I see their intelligence. Oh, yeah. But I, I really do see that it doesn't take much takes to them. teach them. So when I think little. about the context of... They've gone to an environment like a salon or a veterinary clinic. Mm -hmm. They've been stabbed in the back of the neck. They've had a temperature stuck up their bottom, possibly. They've yep. had possibly pills stuffed down their neck or stuff put on the back of their neck to prevent flea and worming treatments. Um, they've been taken away from their owners. Then they've gone to the grooming salon where they've had scissors all snipping around and yep. buzzy. Things being buzzy, poked buzzy, in their buzzy, right? the next And they're tired cool. and they're standing and it's all a bit much. They've been soaked in a bath. They didn't want a bath. Nobody asked them if they wanted a bath, but they're having a bath. Um, I can see that the whole thing is we all go, oh, they're going off for a pamper. Oh, <laughs> don't, that phrase. I know. That right? phrase. <laughs> 100%. Okay, but that's it, isn't it? Oh, you're going to have a pamper. And the dog's yeah. like, no no I'm fine I'm it cool makes us here. feel better using that phrase <laughs> yeah but it's the mindset it's the mindset it's we're humanizing it we go for a pamper because we fully understand the process that yeah. the strength I don't even like that. Even understand yeah. the process I still don't want to go for a pamper right Maybe okay don't touch me. so we've got our we've got our puppies who are at home and you know they're they're quite happily laying by your feet in the morning while you have your breakfast, blissfully unaware of what what the day What's holds for them. And we whisk them up and we take them off and we leave them. Yeah. And 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 then we wonder why they come back and they're like, do you know what? That wasn't such a you know my dog hates going to the groomers. My dog hates going to the vet. Yeah. It didn't need to be that way. Yeah. They've learned to hate it. Yeah. Because and, it wasn't presented to them in such yeah. a fashion as they were ever going to be positive around it, you know? Yeah, yeah. So that, that is, the, the, you know, the downsides to it. Um, I think the other thing that breeders can do really early on, so we've talked a little bit already about sort of desensitising to the actual yeah. equipment, um, you know, as part of it. Yeah. Um, the things that would help me most in the salon that breeders equipped owners for is actually the, the handling side of things as well. So the most important one of the most important things is that actually a puppy can sit still on a table, not for very long. I'm not asking for an hour. I'm asking for, you know, three or four minutes, maybe even, even a minute, even 60 seconds, even 30 seconds, just long enough for me to be able to do something, to do something. with that puppy. I expect a puppy to move around their, you know, their attention spans are really, really short and we build that over time. But if you've had a puppy like we've talked about that's never even stood on a table, 
versus a puppy that's been taught a very gentle stack. So it stands for 60 seconds. I can do something with the puppy. The difference in what I can do for that owner and that puppy is huge because I'm not fighting at that point. It's already a learned behavior that I get on the table and I stand still for X amount of time or I sit for X amount of time. And also the fact that I'm physically going to be holding parts of their body. I think this is a really missed piece of the puzzle. We pick our puppies up and we cuddle them and we do loads of stuff with them. But there are very specific ways in a grooming salon that I will hold a dog and I have to to safely be able to do things. Um, so problem areas with the front legs. So a dog's front leg will have to I have to hold a front leg out to the, out to the front. front. It's extended yeah. to the front. It might be extended to the side. There's things that I'm watching out for as a handler to make sure that they're not physically uncomfortable, although not all groomers will look out for that. Um, but just, just the feeling of having someone hold your paw, stretch your leg out to the front, and then run a brush or something down it. That's not something we teach. We really teach our dogs. Um, formal capacity no yeah in a formal capacity I've got to hold a muzzle to safely be able to trim here and not chop a tongue off or poke a dog in the eye <laughs> I've actually physically got to be able to get my hand and hold them on their nose I've got to be able to hold their chin um they're having them something used to they're having them having something used to coming in towards their eyes I'm scissors it's the big yeah. thing because like, oh look, a thing in my eyes so physically manipulating your dog I, I've literally got to hold them and every part of their body and manipulate different parts of their body. And if that's something we can actually teach our puppies a little bit more formally. And it's a simple case of, I'm holding your leg, here's a tree. It's not rocket science. It just takes a little bit of time and thought yeah. about what's gonna happen. So. You can, um, a, a top tip for this guys um, is if you've got a pup, you know, like I say, invest in a, invest in a secondhand grooming table. For the yeah. for 30 yeah. quid it's going to cost you it's going to pay you dividends so that's the first yeah. thing the second thing is is that you can use and you know again going back to the fact that you know breeders are not trainers okay and trainers are not breeders so you know you trainers are not groomers groomers are not trainers 100 percent. some of those lines get to cross a little bit more exactly the and the more it crosses the more we get to <laughs> benefit one another so what we what we can um what we can do and what is some of the videos that we've actually got in the puppy pod course and in the puppy socialization course is around having the puppy on the table okay and you can get liver paste or squeezy cheese in a tube right so rather than physically giving a treat you can have the dog licking the top of the of the tube have i got something here that looks like a tube let's sticky where's my squeezy cheese it's in the fridge out there let's, let's have a look at this right okay this is a this is a Nicorette patch. I'm in somebody else's office, so I don't know actually what this is. But anyway, we'll go with it. Can you see it on the, on the screen? It's a Nicorette patch. So say you've got this Nicorette patch and you've got the puppy here. Whilst you've got the puppy stood still, you're giving it the, the liver paste. So it's licking and licking and licking the end of the liver paste whilst somebody else is formally handling it. Yeah. Okay. And so the dog is getting a positive reward the whole time that it's just standing still. It's doing what you want it to do. It's standing still and somebody's manipulating its tail, picking its back legs up, picking its front legs up. And all the time, this puppy's just getting some really good vibes for doing these training behaviours. And, and it literally takes three minutes a day. And to be honest, we should be doing it because we should be physically checking our puppies every day. Yeah. Responsible breeders would be having a puppy on you know on their lap you know maybe instead of doing it on your lap do it on the table in a bit more of a formal capacity so it just becomes mm. the norm mm. um and the squeezy cheese is a really good one i prefer it over treats because with a treat there's a a break between the action and the tendency is to put the treat down so or, or the puppy drops crumbs of it out so they break from the frame that you want them what we call a stack break from the frame that you want them to be standing in so if you're doing the squeezy cheese and they're licking it off of the end of literally off of the end of the, yeah. um, the tube you can keep the dog standing in that position yeah um, and it's, it's just a really good way of, of a physically checking the puppy over every day and b getting some of that early training in so yeah. You know, you can start to incorporate. You can also use your licking mats as well. So, you know, some people yeah. might physically be on their own. I mean, it's ideal if you have a second pair of hands, but if you don't, you've got things like your licking mats. So you've still got that source of, you know, pate or squeezy yeah. cheese that your puppy's yeah. got, and then you've both you've got both your hands working. Um, so I use 
I use squeezy cheese or pate or something similar on a licky mat in the bath. With, I think we're talking about bathing a little bit as well. Yeah, think. yeah, yeah. Um, but that'll be something I use for the bath. I tend to keep in the salon, particularly for nail trims, I tend to keep squeezy cheese just for nails. It's usually something a puppy's never had before and it's super, super special. And, I, and owners are under strict instruction that bit, squeezy cheese is not for anything else to begin with. Other than least. nails. Other than nails. And I introduce all my nail trims for puppies. They, so the way I introduce nail trims, ideally a breeder's done this, done nail trims earlier on, but I get a lot of dogs through the salon that never had their nails touched. So for me, I like an owner to stay, the owner gets hold of the squeezy cheese, that's their job. Um, the only instruction they have is that the dog is free to leave. So this is where I take out the fear part. So the squeezy cheese is there. And for as long as the dog stays and is happy for me to handle them, they get the squeezy cheese, but they're free to leave. The cheese goes away, but the dog is free to leave. And after a couple of sets, some dogs I can do their nails straight away like that. Some of them it still takes a few sessions to build that confidence. Um, but I get so many petrified dogs on the table. Don't touch my feet, don't touch my nails. It's one of the biggest no-nos. Don't touch my feet, <laughs> don't touch my nails. Get off, don't touch me. Yeah, mm. exactly, paws, paws and feet. So that's how I introduce nail trims. But okay, really good advice. advice really really good advice so um two questions two two more questions that i wanted to ask you number one is what ad what advice would you give to us regarding keeping our bitches nice and tidy ready for whelping yeah so, cool so depends i'm gonna say it depends it depends on your breed it depends on your skill level it depends on how you usually keep their coats um it depends on how much time you've got like there's a whole list of it depends so just from my own experience um of breeding you know I've I've had a few I've had letters of puppies my mom's had puppies um I've got cut on to they are so they've got long coats long coats yeah well they don't at the moment but <laughs> they usually do um so I've had I've done both I've taken one of my little bitches went into a practical haircut when she had puppies that was easier for her and her character and who she was and, and for me as well at the time that I could actually keep her comfortable. And um, my other bitch stayed in a long coat and I just shaved her belly. Um, I shaved it a couple of weeks in advance. I didn't want to be stressing her, you know, too close to whelping. She's also a dog that's comfortable being groomed. Um, personally, if someone brought a pregnant bitch to me in the salon and said, can you shave my dog? Absolutely not. That dog goes into a practical trim before you're thinking of breeding but if your bitches are used to being groomed they're happy it's something that you know they're okay with or that all you do yourself then I don't I don't see that there's a problem with that it's the stress factor as opposed to the grooming itself yeah, it. okay yeah Thanks, then. um if you've got if you've got your doodles and your doodles and I'd put them in a practical trim I'd be I'd be yeah. seven neffing them by neffing them off four mil six mil left I'd be like not doing that it grows back and you can make it look beautiful again yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Practicality over vanity for me every day. I just think comfort. practicality for me, especially around you know, like you, you know, these dogs have got coats on that they can't take off, and we're going to yeah. put a heat lamp on them. You know, yeah. they're they're potentially and they're hot. Yeah, that's a good point. Get really hot. They get really hot. They overheat. They dehydrate, and you know, they they're not to mention the 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 cleanliness aspect of it. Yeah. You know, like with a coated breed. Even to be honest, I'm breeding from Springer Spaniel bitches, and they get really mucky. They're hairy. So they've, got they've, they've got feathers. They've got feathers, and it just yeah. gets mucky. Yeah. Um, so There's nothing I, else. Um, trim around your areas that need trimming. You know, yeah. your belly, your your bum, your privates, or you know, you know, breeders. You know what happens. I, yeah. I mean, I even I take off. I'm quite savage around the ears. I'm like because they even get like it just all, flood it they just get flood skull. don't yeah it's and just then it crusts on the end just oh. gross yeah so that all needs to come off so yeah that's that's what I do but um cool okay but you would advise that that either happens like before they're covered um in the first instance so before they're even mated so that they're already yeah. in a very short coat in the first instance yeah so it depends and on the scenario so if, if if you're if you're a breeder that doesn't do your own grooming and your dogs are more stressed about grooming in general and you take them to a groomers do that before you know before. i'm talking a week before you know you're mating because yeah, yeah. It, the whole thing is stressful and you know your bitch you, you all know this your bitch can lose puppies um, you know, if they're stressed any time around that, they're, you know, there's pivotal dates. Mm -hmm. So for me, I'd be wow. taking it to the grooming salon and be like seven athletes all over, ears, tail, whatever, the, the lot. Because, you know, by the time, it, 
to be honest, they might need grooming again during pregnancy. It depends on your bitch and the stress levels. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, keep it as short as possible with as least stress as possible. And you know your bitches and you know your own skill level as well. I know there are a lot of breeders that will actually be doing that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And and again, you know, pay the extra. Have your groomer come to you. You know, I have a bitch that really does not like the groomers. Um, she unfortunately had a, a bad experience with a groomer not a groomer that I use now a groomer before it wasn't actually the groomer's fault um it was a, a dog just slipped out of the there were two dogs in the salon one of the, the other dog got out of the cage um and just went for her and she's just been petrified ever since so it's just it was just one of those freak accidents it could have happened to anybody um but she doesn't like and, and so I have a fantastic groomer now her name's Helen she's great she's a local lady she comes to me yeah yes yeah, so you get different you get mobile groomers you get yeah, groomers she comes to me so oh, I don't oh. have to have the whole yeah, the stress you know you know, I, you know I have a very quiet salon here so if I can have a relationship with a breeder that I do have slots in my diary where I'm the only person in here you know, those yeah. kind of slip-ups can't happen then if it's Perfect. just me and the owner and the dog yeah, yeah. In the group. So, yeah, yeah we'll go on to what to look for in a groomer in a bit yeah yeah, yeah definitely so bones. talk to me about bathing so you know okay. again I have a coated breed, yeah. puppies get stinky, they roll around in their own poo, they're great at it. You know, how do we successfully bath a puppy without drowning it, you know, getting water up its nose and frightening it half, in its ears and frightening it half to death? <laughs> what's, the, what's the trick? Tell us the trick. I feel like some of it's common sense, um, but actually it's, again, it's slowing down and looking at ways of introducing things slowly and in tiny, tiny baby steps. Um, so if you're already including stuff like we've already talked about ENS and introducing scents um, and introducing like a toothbrush, you know, you said before your puppy's, you know, it's three weeks old before, you know, even the ears and eyes are totally open. You know, there's no reason why you can't be gently wiping the puppy over really early on with a damp piece of cotton wool. That might be your first bath a damp piece of cotton wool. As soon as, as soon as your puppies are, you know, toddling around on their tiny little leg. Um, and you've got different surfaces in there, have a tray of water, like with just a tiny bit on it, like you're building up those really, really small steps so that water becomes part of that picture. So then by the time they're, you know, a bit bigger and a bit more confident, eyes are open, ears are open, they've got their toys and you're starting to do things with them. They're at that really interesting stage. You've now got two inches of water in it. You know, if you're going to be supervised, you're not going to leave your, you know, your boy or something to the cuddling for it. Some of it's common sense. But yeah, I'd be introducing water in that context and making sure that the temperature is warm. Like a baby's bath water, you're going to put your wrist in there and make sure it's not too cold, not too hot. It's not going to be a shock either way. And the next thing is, you know, maybe you'll have a kid's watering can and then the water's moving next to them. You're like you're sprinkling it in front of them. So just water moving around them and touching them and they're having their feet in it, like all of that stuff is going to help. And again, it's scents and it's noises. You know, a bottle of shampoo is going to smell to the dog. So having the scent yeah. of man there. Yeah. Um, having them next to a shower. So you might decide to go and have a shower, you know, and have your puppy in the bathroom, I don't know. But anything that you can do safely to introduce that really early on. Um, okay. You're not going to hurt advice. a puppy by bathing it. It's more about that fear factor. How much can you introduce them to before you just stick them in the bath? Because like you said, they stink. <laughs> yeah, they do. They stink. Yeah, they stink. And, the puppy stink. yeah they do. they're horrible. They're stinky little things. Yeah. 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 And, you know, the the... I think again it's that level of expectation isn't it instead of instead of thinking to yourself today we're going to bath a puppy yeah it's thinking to yourself today we're going to perform a foundation exercise to prepare the puppy for being bathed next week before you've got a stinky six week old puppy you know that you've had some water trays and they've had some water moving around them and on them and you've touched them and wiped them over and they've smelt the shampoos like that stuff's all been done prior so that when you stick them in the bath you're not going to just be shocking them because yeah. I think some I don't know but I, I have had experience of puppy's first bath is the day before you know the day it leaves for its new family so it goes home clean you know that that to me is too much yet you do want to send home a clean puppy it's nice of course, of I course. brought home a stinking farm puppy and you know he yeah. was stuck in the bath yeah. the first day had him home he was vile but ideally <laughs> Yeah, ideally, you would prepare them for that point in just the same way as you would prepare them for their first car journey. 
yeah. or you would prepare them for their first trip out. I get it. I get it. I get it. Okay. Really I made good. a really daft mistake and not plugged my laptop in. I'm not entirely sure where the lead is. I'm going to have to find it or you're going to lose me. I was looking for it earlier and then forgot what I was doing. So. Go find it. Go find it. Before I'm going to go find my lead. One more question for you so we can't lose you Bear yet. Bear with me. Has anybody got any questions while Zoe's finding her laptop cable? Has anybody got any questions for her? Now is the time to be typing, guys. Bath mine in a saucepan of... Uh, Charlotte's saying she bath mine in a saucepan of warm water. Obviously not on the hob. I love that. That's absolutely hilarious. And she says, Zoe, your doggy clients are lucky to have you. Well, that's lovely. Oh, that's really sweet. I heard that. Yeah. <laughs> Okey-doke. Justine says hi. Got lots of people watching. No, you're not going to lose me now. Are you in? Are you plugged in? We're back. We're back. Excellent. Right, so I want to know yes. what to look for in a groomer. What okay, to look so for in a groomer? Uh, we're going to give our beautiful puppies that have been bathed and prepped properly they're yep. clipper ready. They've got a, a nice stack on the table. They're all good to go. Yep. We're going to hand our babies over to their owners and their owners are going to say, how do we find a good groomer? Yep. Okay, so go back to your ideal, perfect scenario. Um, what you're looking for would be something like a fear-free fear -free groomer. That is its own certification. There are very few of them around. <laughs> So you can look for fear free. There are also a couple of um, grooming groups on Facebook as well. There's um, Sue Williamson's taking the girl out of grooming. She's got a group and also Stephanie Zipman, who is a groomer in Scotland. She also has a group. So you're able as a, as a pet owner or as a breeder or anyone really to go into this group. Do you know a groomer in such and such area that's holistic, that's force free, that has a training background? or that has a fear-free certification, they're all kind of markers of groomers that are gonna, gonna work in that really ethical kind of welfare-led standard. So the problem often with finding a groomer is that training and behavior isn't part of a groomer's education. It's very, very basic. Um, you know, yeah, it's a really big missing piece as far as I'm concerned. I'm a trainer and a groomer, so for me, those two pieces are both really important and it's missing. Um, so if you can find someone that's got any kind of training background, any kind of fear-free, force-free, positive reinforcement, they're the kind of words that you're looking for. That you're looking for. Okay. You're looking for. Reach out, you know, point your people in the direction of those groups, point them in the direction of my Facebook group. You know, we can try and find a groomer that has one of those things. That's like your top, that's like top of the triangle. That's your top really. level. Yeah. Um, yeah. Your next level down is the grooming industry is unregulated. Um, anyone can be a groomer the same as anyone can be a trainer or be a breeder it's not just because someone calls themselves something it's not really a, it's not always a you know the standards there can be all over the place um, so there are generic grooming qualifications you've got city and guild you've got OCN you really want as a bare minimum to be taking your dog somewhere where there's an actual grooming qualification um, Unless sometimes you do find old school groomers that are qualified, but they've done it for a very long time and they have a lot of experience under their belt. Um, so just sort of be aware of the, the experience or the qualifications that's behind someone. But for me, the most important thing is, do I like this person? Are they prepared to talk to me on the phone? Are they prepared to answer my questions? Are they prepared to take me seriously as an owner and not just say, oh, it's fine? Um, you know, or, or fob me off, or I really would, if I'm looking for a groomer for my dogs, I'm looking for someone I can speak to that's going to answer my questions. I'm looking for a quiet salon. So a mobile, a mobile groomer, you know, equally, I'm looking for someone that works one-to-one -one with dogs, that doesn't have multiple dogs in the same room. Um, so how I work here in the salon, we've got two rooms, two groomers, and our dogs don't cross over from different households. We've got double barriers in here. We've got lots of systems in place to keep dogs safe. Um, looking for somewhere quiet. Um, I've been, <laughs> I've been in experiences of being in a grooming salon where the radio has been turned up. If you've ever heard a dog blaster, you know how loud they are. I wear ear defenders when I'm using blasters because they damage your hearing. I've been in a salon where the radio was playing to be heard over the blasters, and then the radio was left that loud when the blasters were turned off, and that was the noise level in the salon. So you're looking for somewhere quiet. <laughs> 
So not too much background noise. Um, you're looking for someone one-to-one. -one. You're looking for someone that answers your questions or asks you a lot of questions. So if you got on the phone to me, I have, I have a ton of questions for you because I want to make sure your dog's looked after. I want to know whether they're scared to be in a crate. I do have crates in here, but I'm not going to stick a dog in a crate if it's scared to be in a crate. I'm not going to keep your dog longer than absolutely necessary. Um, as a puppy owner, I would want you to be staying with your puppy anyway. So even finding a groomer that's actually prepared to have an owner stay with their yeah. puppy. Yeah. Yeah, most yeah. groomers say all the dogs behave better when they're not there. That's because they're scared, generally. <laughs> that's why they behave better when they yeah, yeah, leave. Yeah, yeah. So, they're, yeah. Not, they're not behaving better, they just shut down. They yeah, can't cope they with what's going on. So, and so they just oh, shut down. Just, just, little, just do it, just do it, just do it, get it over with. Yeah. That's a puppy that's not fighting to the other end of that spectrum. So yeah, ask, be prepared to ask a lot of questions and really trust your gut instinct. You know, get, tell your owners to trust their gut instincts on it. I think it's like having a kid as well. It's the same kind of thing. It's We tend to trust the advice of the professionals around us. And at some point, we lose our own gut instinct about things. So be prepared to ring three or four or five different groomers and have those conversations. Yeah. Don't just go to the nearest groomer. Um, so yeah. and, 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 it's, and it's also, um, for me, it's, it's taking the grooming experience as something as that is actually serious and not just a, a just something that has to happen yeah. you know it's training for grooming yeah preparation for grooming mm -hmm. because grooming is going to happen mm. pretty bloody regularly yeah so and it's something it, yeah and once that puppy's left your hands yeah your then also are set to the expectation at least the they expectation really involved yeah. in that process yeah yeah yeah, yeah it's completely yeah. completely and it's discussing sure. it's discussing the grooming requirement yeah. and all that it involves and setting that level of expectation with the owners yeah. so the owners take the puppy knowing how they're going to approach this knowing how to yeah. you know, get the right advice and get it but that that needs to start with us that needs to start with us really seriously prepping them for it because yeah. I think they, like you say I think they think they go to the groomers once every six months and ta-da you know I wish I had a magic grooming one <laughs> puppy's had a spa day you know puppy's had a spa day it's ready for its insta photograph it has a bow tie around its neck it's all looking pretty everybody's happy the dog's sitting there thinking get me out of here this is horrendous <laughs> As far as, as far as setting expectations for your owners go as well, like there's a few expectations that I would love breeders to set for their owners, especially when you've got things like your doodles. Um, so all my doodles are on a five week schedule. Ideally, I want them in every four weeks, which is most commonly you hear a six to eight week schedule. Yeah, it's, yeah. Too far. it's way too far spread apart, even at six weeks. It's beyond that sweet spot of what's comfortable physically for a dog. Um, so gradually I've taken over a salon that was already running on an old model so I've managed to get my clients to five weeks really and truly I'd like them every month every dog every I have through my doors ideally I want I groom my own dogs every month in fact some of them yeah. get them weekly depends on their yeah. needs yeah um, and yeah. minimum monthly price wise you as as breeders you get to you get to set those expectations as well mm -hmm. um you know I, I see so many groomers pages oh 35 pounds for my cock and poo it was so expensive you come to me you're getting you it's going to be 55 60 quid you know if you're regular and you're in every month it's 50 if your dog stands for me you know realistic expectations about cost and how cost. often yeah. the dog is going to be brought and in. you get what you pay for and you, know, you get what you pay you for. You get what you pay for. You really do. So, so yeah, it's yeah. actually setting that expectation for owners that they're going to be taking to their dogs to the groomers every four or five weeks, and it is going to cost them, you know, anything 50 or 60 pounds is not outside of the normal bracket for a really good groomer. No. You know, that's that's part of, I believe, part of a breeder's job to set those expectations. Absolutely. And the last piece, and I'm, I could rant about this one all night <laughs> on expectation setting, is coat length particularly again with your doodles so what I find is that my pedigree dogs my poodles my bichons things like that can be on a six-week schedule in a reasonable trim and they don't get as matted the doodles because of the genetics and the crossing of the different coat types and things I find they do mat more easily um they, they just do I mean I love doodles my mom's got doodles and you know they, they're great they're fun little dogs I'm not pedigree or, or crossbreed no, or whatever no, 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 no. but the coats are different they really really are and 
people come in and they they want fluffy they want big they want fluffy they want long hair I mean, if you want fluffy your dog needs to be bathed and um, bathed and brushed and styled weekly weekly you can't bring a doodle into me every six weeks and have a fluffy dog it's too much for the dog it's too painful um so actually having breeders set the set the precedent and set the expectation and show them what that looks like get a photo have one of your own bitches or dogs in your own household in a practical trim that looks nice i'm not saying shave them off you know i'm saying oh, yeah. a reasonable haircut because that dog then gets to live life, it gets to go outside and get mucky and not yeah. come to me and be uncomfortable. So yeah, I say this, we have... Fun. I have to, as part of the process, obviously, you know, uh, of people purchasing a puppy from me, they, they yeah. often say to me, you know, how often does this puppy need grooming? Yeah. Um, and I say, well, it depends what you want your puppy to look like. Yes, absolutely. You know? If you depends. are prepared to put in, it depends how much are you going to do? You know, are yeah. you going to breed, are you going to, you know, be, be grooming your puppy yeah. every two to three days from top to bottom? Yeah. Are you the kind of owner that's going to go rolling around in the woods with your dog on a daily basis? And are you going to take it home to your cream yeah. carpets? You know, what What do you What's want? What's your, your lifestyle? Dog? What do yeah. you want from your dog? Yeah, yeah. Do and then you them? have to yeah. dress appropriately. Yeah. You have to dress your dog appropriately for the lifestyle. You know, yeah. it's like choosing what kind of coat you're going to go out in by looking out yeah. the window, you know. You yeah. need to frame it for them yeah. according to their commitment as an owner their yeah. skill level mm -hmm. and then say to them you know if you want your dog to look like this yeah that's what you need this to do this is what it takes this is what it takes <laughs> to look that like that, that. This is you that know. story exactly. to the groomer's dog that looks absolutely exactly. beautiful you know yeah. versus yeah. the the one that is you know that's being shaved off and mm. and it's a real shock for owners the first time that their yeah. noodle comes <laughs> back to the groomer and you know and fluffy got got the short back and sides yeah they're I like oh my god my yeah. dog looks like a rat. What <laughs> happened? What happened? <laughs> and that gets to be more a clearer conversation between an owner and a groomer as well. Those conversations are sometimes missing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I quite yeah. often, I quite often advise my owners to take in a photograph of what they would yeah, like. Yeah, like, I do. Like. I have a photograph. Yeah. yeah, I say just take in a photograph, and then there's no. I thought you meant this. Yes. Oh no, you meant that. You know. Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. You know, that, that that stops that piece. That stops and it. I right, think we've got some. Yeah, got on that same conversation you. as well, just be before we go on to the questions, the other thing, two more things I would love, love, love breeders to teach their owners. One thing is how to brush their dogs. So we're still talking about our long haired dogs. Um, I find a lot of owners aren't taught to brush. So between the breeder and the groomer, there needs to be an education piece in there and that's how to brush. So I would love to see puppies sent home with the right brush and the right comb. None of these you know, cheapy pound shop dog brushes, a decent slicker brush and a comb and just a tutorial on line brushing. How do we part their coat? We go from base to tip and we work the whole dog inside of the leg, outside of the leg, front of the leg, back of the leg, you know, paw behind the ears. Because if an owner can brush their dogs at home, that then buys us time to work as a team to introduce the dog to everything without the mats and all of the, you know, the problems starting. And the other thing I would love breeders to introduce as an idea to their owners is that teeth need cleaning. Teeth get to be cleaned ideally daily, but also in the salon environment, there's a lot of groomers that use the EmiPet, the ultrasonic toothbrushes to really stop dental problems building up. You need to be cleaning at home. You need to be cleaning at the groomers. And you need to have your vets checking them as well. I've had dog's teeth falling out on my floor, literally, literally. By the time your dog has got a wobbly tooth, you've got a four hundred pound dental bill in front of you, yeah. minimum, and it's painful. And your dog's so, in pain. Yeah, yeah. I'm dog's holding a dog's pain. muzzle to to trim their face, and they've got a mouth of rotten teeth. Like that's painful. So as breeders, if we can set the expectations that teeth need looking at like daily it's a daily health check you know ears are the same nails are the same nails need to be done you know every week or two weeks monthly just again if, while we're in the box of expectation yeah, yeah, completely, completely, completely and it's about mm. keeping it real for people you know these yeah. are the responsibilities that they're going to be facing yeah. and if and if we as breeders don't tell the owners then who the hell is going to you know, the dogs can't sometimes say it, can they? Will. Sometimes yeah. the will. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes that dog then goes... And, and sometimes it, they go eight months between seeing yeah. these people and it's too long. Yeah. So, yeah. right, uh, Charlotte, <laughs> Charlotte says, there's so much conflicting advice about when to start grooming schnauzers if stripping. What would you recommend? 
as soon as it will strip. <laughs> For me, it's to start absolutely everything as early as possible. There's loads of myths out there, or you can't do, you know, you can't do this with this specific breed before this time because it will X, Y, Z, fill in the gaps. And it's not true. If you if you have a any dog, whether that's a hand strip schnauzer or whether that's a you know a cockapoo with a curly coat, you Clipping isn't going to ruin the coat. Hand stripping isn't going to ruin the coat. It might change it a little bit, but it's going to change anyway as that dog gets older. For me, the most important thing is to start that dog off on the routine that it's going to be set in for the rest of its life as early as possible. I'm not a schnauzer expert and I'm not a hand stripping expert. It's not my favorite thing to do. Um, you know, so you, you can go out and find, find people who specialize. Okay. Who specialize in that stuff that might have a a different opinion but for me in general started you mean to go on and get them used to stuff like really really yeah. early on and little and i think for me little little and often, often, oh, little and often, often I mean, concerned, yeah yeah, yeah 100%. Dog in twice yeah. A year, it's too much that's a yeah. great I, I tend to do like my pointer um she's never she's 15 months old and she's never been stripped by a groomer yeah but you're doing i it literally before. sit at home and you're i have my little I, I put my little rubber bits and pieces on my fingers and I've got my chalk and I just sit there. Condoms. <laughs> I set my little finger condom and I just sit there and I just literally just take a few, just yeah. take a few and then I'll just work my way down. And then when she starts getting antsy, you know, that's I get the squeeze cheese out. Done. That's, how, that's yeah. how you roll a coat. She's done. She's done. Another, how you roll She's done. Coat. Yeah. yeah, you shouldn't be taken into a groomer twice a year. It's too much. And no, actually, much. A, a neutering does affect coat as well. So if you're selling... Uh, if you're selling dogs that um, are hand stripped dogs, if you're breeding, you know, Border Terriers, Lakeland, Irish, um, and if anything that's going to have a shoulders strippable coat, uh, I get owners coming into me with a beautiful dog whose coat would have stripped, but it's already been clipped or it's already been neutered. Those two things can affect the stripping. They don't always, but they can. Again, that's expectations. Explaining that to your owners ahead of time that those are the decisions that are going to come up. So, yeah, okay. um, I've got Claire asking, how can we get puppies used to the scissoring around the face? Because the first, one of the first thing they say, especially with the doodles, the dog can't see. So yeah. how do we, what, is there a, a trick? Yes. Yeah, so we're moving into the realms of training. Yeah, okay. for sure. Um, so the way I teach it is it's dist it's distraction basically so if you want I'm, go I'm, I'm going into trainer mode for a second so bear with me if you're training any behavior whether you want your dog to lie down and wait for you or whether you want it to stay still while you're clipping its face the fastest way to get any stationary behavior is distraction so I'll explain what that means um so for example I want to teach a puppy to rest their chin on something and what I'm going to do is the sec I'm going to put my put my hands under their chin. I'm going to say good and feed the treat. I'm then going to maybe just flick a little finger. That's a distraction. The dog's going to move away. I'm going to wait for them to go back. Good and treat. And I'm going to make those distractions bigger. So when I'm training a dog to have its face flipped, first of all, I want to either be able to have them rest their chin on something or on my hand. And I want that to be a very still behavior. So I'm going to build up moving things around and expect them to stay still and reward them for staying still. So my hand initially is the distraction. I'm then going to have the scissors in my hand. It's nowhere near them. Those scissors are going to go slightly closer to their face and move away. Every moment that your dog is still, I'm going to mark. I'm going to say good. I'm going to say yes, whatever word you want to use. It doesn't matter. And I'm going to give that puppy a treat. What you're building is a behavior where your dog is still yeah, and is used behavior. to things coming in towards their face. If you just hold them and go in, it's going to go, oh, crap, yeah, what happened? It's harsh. Yeah, it's building a really nice still behavior early on. You are moving into training, but actually it's a really valuable skill to learn if it's something that interests you. Yeah, definitely. And, it's you know, it's, it's life skills. You know, this is socialization. Yeah. yeah, this is this is socialization. This is just as important as playing firework sounds. This is just mm -hmm. as important as taking them for their car, first car uh, ride, yeah. introducing them to people that they've never met before. All of that stuff. This piece around the grooming. Yeah. This, grooming is something that our dogs are going to live with regularly. Fireworks happens once a year, and we make a big deal about yeah, that. Grooming and happens and, like weekly. <laughs> like, nobody makes a deal about grooming, so it's really, really. I think really the important. principle that's easy to remember is rewarding for what you want. 
So whenever yeah. you're training it, well, it, it applies to dogs at any age of their life. But when you've got a puppy, puppies are so bright and, and they're, they're a pretty clean slate. So yeah. if your dog is staying still, reward it, catch those moments, catch moments those moments of stillness. Of stillness. Focus. That's what I'm looking for when I'm training a puppy. Is a what about what about products? Okay, so what about puppy yeah. safe products? Okay, let's let's talk about that now. Yeah. We've we've I don't know your your personal position. We haven't spoken about that, but right back at the beginning yeah. of the week, we were speaking to Anna Webb around um, environmental stressors and mm -hmm. around like a very chemically smelling product. Oh, yeah, right. strong good. smells. Yeah, good. So you know, what do you advise? Are there any? Um, very eco-friendly based products yeah yeah so, there is quite a quite a big choice and you're right again it's that scent picture, scent picture. Um, a lot <laughs> and we're going back to the whole it's a spa day thing humans like scented things um but i i don't and i avoid them um so when you're choosing your shampoos and conditioners and things you are looking i use wild wash in the salon there are others that's just what we've got in here at the moment um it is scented, but it's essential oils. It's very gentle. It's not those like really strong perfume. Dog smell, yeah, yeah. So your dog's still going to smell pleasant, but it's not overwhelming, for, you okay. know, for them. Yeah. Um, they do have a non-scented version, and there are a lot of other brands as well that um that do gentle stuff. So you're looking for your keywords, like you just said, eco-friendly. Um, you know, you're vegan. You get organic ones as well. I would steer clear from the big name groomer shampoos. Yeah. Uh, they do their job, but they're often a lot more perfumey. So yeah, you, there are lots and lots of gentle options out there, and I I do prefer them. I go as natural as I possibly can. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Well. Going back to the fact that they see the world through their noses. Through their noses. And we go, yeah. you know, we smell a shampoo and go, ooh, you know. And for a dog, it'll be like, oh my god, it's making my eyes water. Yeah. Oh, Christ, and so actually, cool. it's it's actually caring for their their skin and their coat as well. So you may have heard the myth like backing your dog too often. Um, is going to ruin their damage their coat or strip all the natural oils of their coat that's quite an old myth and it's one reason why most people don't take their dog for a regular bath yeah actually yeah. when shampoos were originally being developed a lot of them were very strong and did strip those oils out of the coat and were very very harsh i think the grooming products we have now aren't so much same with our own hair you know if you use the bar of soap on your hair like it's going to do yeah. some damage but yeah. you know using the right products so I use conditioner as well, nearly nearly always, because you are always. putting those oils back into the coat. So a nice natural shampoo gets your dog nice and clean, condition, put the oils back in the coat, and then you're actually looking at the coat and the skin. So yeah, it's a good... It's Fantastic. A good. That's really, really good advice. Well, guys, we're going to wrap it up there. That's all the questions yeah. answered. That has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you Thank very you for much having for, me. for sharing your knowledge with us, darling. We Pleasure. Been, the more happy I get through have... my door, like that are happy to be groomed and owners that are aware of this stuff, like the happier I'll be. <laughs> that's, and that's where, you know, that's for me, this whole week has been around, you know, dealing with some of these crossovers. Yeah. You know, get, getting yeah. breeders into talking, you know, to groomers, to 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 trainers, to vets, to vet yeah. nurses and really, you know, yeah. I think we're, we're all coming from the same place. We all want yeah. the same thing. But I breeders just think love their puppies. Yeah. they want to yeah. set them up for the best lives possible. That's it. That's you know, it. We're so all we're coming from the same them. place. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. So, guys. So that is the last of our guest speakers for the week. Thank you very much, Zoe. It's been wonderful. Um, don't forget, guys, um, tomorrow is the last live. Depending on how my Wi-Fi is looking <laughs> tomorrow evening, I um, I might hot seat a, a breeder for the evening, um, but I'm not going to promise because if I don't have any electric, that might be a little bit tricky. But, um, but whatever happens, I will be with you live tomorrow evening at 7.30 in the group. And one lucky person who has um, enrolled onto the Level 3 course by tomorrow evening at 7.30 is going to get their name drawn out of the hat. And one of you is going to get a free mentoring program to go with your course. Um, but you have to have enrolled by tomorrow evening. Now, I have had a few people asking me about payment plan options. Um, obviously, we are now enrolling for the April course. January is sold out. And yes, in answer to those questions, there is a payment plan that we will be um, sorting out formally next week. Um, obviously, the National Dog Breeder Convention and everything will happen quite quickly regards the planning of it. So um, a payment plan isn't something we formalised, but 
if people are wanting to book onto the April course and they're a little bit worried about money coming up to Christmas and committing to a, a large payment like that, it's absolutely fine. Just email me. I am a human being. I am not a monster. You know, we can have conversations around money. It's just money. We can sort that piece out. What I want is you guys enrolling because we want people to be educated around this breeding, um, you know, th this breeding qualification because it's really important. Um, and, um, and I think you can see across this week that there is so much value to be learned around the community build part of it and that it's not just a piece of paper it's not just a course it's not just a qualification it's actually standing together and being part of something moving forward into 2022 and moving forward in terms of ethical breeding in the UK and really really standing up and and and, and being counted and making it making a difference so that's that's what it's all about so if you've got any questions around that course anything at all you want to know please drop me an email it might take me longer than my usual 10 minutes to reply because uh, apparently my husband's messaging me to say we've still got no power and we've still got no wi-fi but i will definitely get back to you i'll walk up the end of the road and get some 4g um and uh, and get back to anybody that's got any questions so thank you enjoy your saturday evening i bid you all farewell and i will speak to you tomorrow thanks again zoe pleasure Over if anyone that, has guys. Any... If anyone has any more questions, you can come and join my Facebook group and I'm always Yes, there. oh, the Facebook group. Yes. Room from your living room is Zoe's, is, Zoe's, is Zoe's group. So if anybody's got specific questions, anybody's got anything that they want to know about, so please. If they think about something afterwards tonight, just jump in the group. And 100% leave. just yeah. jump over. Zoe's more than happy to have you. Sorry, I nearly forgot to say that. That's yes, all right. Very important. <laughs> well, well reminded, well saved. Yeah. All right then, guys, I'll see you later.